Hello and welcome to the seminar of normalization and information. Every semester I offer a seminar, an advanced reading seminar, called Renormalization and Information on topics in quantum many body theory and quantum information theory. I began offering this seminar several years ago as a way to catch up with classic results in quantum information theory and quantum many body theory. As, I'm, as my life is pretty time poor, I don't often have the luxury of reading papers anymore and this seminar is really a chance for me to benefit from the hard work of the students. And the way it works is that every semester I would choose a topic centered in somewhere in the areas of many body theory and quantum information theory, find a paper, and then together with the students we would read through the paper, getting into the details, following up uh, subsequent results, looking at citations and so on, in an attempt to try and understand and learn the main techniques or results of this or that paper that I'd chosen. Really it's a very selfish uh, exercise on my behalf. I get to learn about things that I've always wanted to learn about, but also I feel that it's a great opportunity for students to get uh, to come to grips with and learn and acquire a bunch of skills that they would need in their research lives. So for example, um, often the format of the seminar would be presentations by myself for the first couple of weeks on the necessary background material to understand the paper. And then very quickly, the students would get the opportunity to present parts of the paper. They'd read through the paper and uh, digest the material, distill the material into something that they understood and then prepare a presentation of some 20 to 30 minutes that they would then deliver in the time frame of the seminar. This format has proven very successful and uh, via this seminar, we've had, uh, I've had the great opportunity to learn a great many interesting topics such as quantum machine learning and category theory for anionic systems. This semester is no exception. I wanna offer the seminar again. However, the format of this semester will be naturally a little different. My plan is to offer everything online as far as possible. And what that means today is that I will be videoing the lectures that I would ordinarily be giving within the context of the seminar and uploading them. The format of these videos will be a little bit different from the videos that are offered so far. I've decided to go with a far less edited format. So you'll be getting much more of the stream of consciousness uh, approach to reading through the material and decisions and the presentation of the material. I'll only edit out long uncomfortable pauses but otherwise I want to uh, share with you my thought processes as we go through the various topics of the seminar. This semester I'm going to do things a little differently. Ordinarily I would have already chosen the paper that uh, the seminar would focus on for the semester. However, today I've decided to give you an insight into my decision-making process for how I choose a paper for the seminar. So I've distilled the choice of topic for the seminar down to three papers. Three uh, papers on three absolutely classic results in quantum information theory and many body theory. So the three papers that I've chosen today are for, and I would now go through these papers and sort of explain my decision making and why I find these papers interesting. And then as I go through the papers, I'll also give an insight into what I think might make an interesting choice for this seminar. So the first paper uh, I, on the short list, so to speak, is the paper entitled Black Holes as Mirrors and Quantum Information in Random Subsystems by Patrick Hayden and John Preskill. This is an absolutely classic result now in the lying at the interface between quantum information theory and quantum gravity. And one of the reasons why I put this paper on the short list is because it's a, I know it's an important result that many, many people have uh, been inspired by and has been built on. Also, I have to admit, I've never really read the paper properly. This would be a good chance for me to, uh, to actually uh, learn some material that I really should have learned many, many years ago. The next paper that I've got on the short list is Perturbative Gadgets at Arbitrary Orders by Stephen Jordan and Edward Fahey. It's also a paper on absolutely classic construction due to Kempe, Kataev, and Regev 
called the perturbative gadget. Now, this is also a result that I should better know better, but don't actually know very well. Um, but I'm, I've never really used perturbative gadgets in anger and uh, would rather like to be able to do so, but I've never felt confident enough to read through the uh, details of the Kempi, Gataev and Regev paper where these, uh, these objects were introduced. Uh, and this paper here that I've chosen seems to, at first sight, offer a very uh, clean and uh, uh, streamlined exposition of this technique. The third paper I've chosen is another total classic. It's called Lagrangian Representation for Fermionic Linear Optics by Sergei Bravi. Now, in my lectures on quantum field theory, I've often discussed Grassmann variables and uh, fermions. However, I've never gotten into the nitty-gritty details of the uh, equivalent fermionic Gaussian representations that you can build with Grassmann variables. And this paper is a, a um, fundamental paper in the area that explains in beautiful detail how one can obtain the so-called quasi-distributions and positivity conditions for fermionic operations. So these are the three papers I've got on the short list. Um, this paper, as with the other two, the, the paper by Sergey Brevi, that is, as with the other two, the reason for the choice of this particular paper is it's a skill or it's a technique that I haven't, I'm aware of, but I haven't actually read through in detail. And I'm hoping that this seminar gives me and you the opportunity to learn one of these three skills in greater detail. I'm just looking through my seminar notes here. So how are we going to proceed? Well, the one thing I want to emphasize is that it's an extremely nonlinear process. It's a, uh, the way I read a paper is an extremely nonlinear process. So I don't just download the paper and start reading it. In particular, I'm going to give you an insight into the kind of almost random, a, a random effects, random. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you an insight into the almost random seeming process by which I uh, read through a paper. It's pretty unpredictable, so I can't tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to start reading one of these papers in a minute, and we'll try and make a decision which one to read. And, uh, and then you'll see how I sort of settle down on one of these three papers. Ideally, I'd love to go through all three in this seminar. I think realistically, over the next 13, 10 to 13 weeks, we'll only cover one of these three papers. I don't think it's realistic to go any further. You'll see that it, there's quite an amount of uh, details that we go into and quite a, a, uh, a lot of effort is required to read a paper for this seminar. So the format will be, I will talk about my choice today. Also, we'll get maybe started into reading one of the three papers. And then maybe for the next five to 10 videos, we'll, uh, you will see me read through the paper and we'll discuss the paper, as in I'll discuss it to you and uh, you can listen. However, you of course have the opportunity to respond. And then after five to 10 weeks, I'll open up the seminar for contributions. Now, you as a viewer are welcome to contribute in the form of your own videos. I certainly welcome any contributions you might have to this seminar on one of these three papers. So, or you'd be very welcome to, to offer a video, but you'd also of course be welcome to share with us a podcast perhaps and your experience with reading the paper, or perhaps you might wanna write a blog post or something like that. If you participate, you're most welcome to do so. Please just, uh, share with me your uh, experience with going through the paper in the seminar. So I'm going to commence today with the process, this sort of thought process that I'm going to go through in choosing one of these three papers. Now, here they are. These are the three papers. Now I'll just go to, I've downloaded each of these three papers. Here's the paper by Sergei Bravi, but I want to start with the first paper here which is black holes as mirrors, quantum information, and random subsystems. So um, what I'll do is, the first thing I'm gonna do is sort of scan through the paper very, very quickly, just get a feeling for what kind of content is in the paper, like how big is it, you know, what sort of, um, you know, what sort of moment of inertia does this paper have 
uh, scientifically. So as I'm scanning through here, I'm not reading the text at all. I'm just looking at the sections, how they're named, looking at the displayed equations. Here's an interesting displayed equation. And I'm asking myself the question, do I, uh, does this look familiar? Can I uh, build off knowledge that I already have to understand this paper? I see a maximally entangled state there. That's some, probably a good sign. I know what those are. And then we have some kind of process diagram here. Now we have some more heavy equations. I can certainly see uh, Patrick Hayden's influence in some of these equations. Uh, and there's quite a bit of text here. Now we have four sections so far and we're up to what looks to be page 10. Okay, so the density of equations in this paper is not super high, um, which might make it a very challenging paper to read. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but so far I see some norms, I see some sections, a lot of text, um, some diagrams like this, what appears to be a space-time diagram there. Uh, and now we're at the conclusions. So in terms of displayed equations, this paper had what, maybe 10, 15 displayed equations. Most of the displayed equations to my eyes look fairly familiar. There didn't seem to be any crazy symbols or notations that I'm not familiar with. So I feel kind of immediately kind of comfortable uh, with the proposition of going through this paper. I don't feel as though I'm going to have to spend five weeks of remedial work reading through an advanced number theory book in order to uh, get at least started on this paper. Okay, so that was black holes as mirrors. Now we'll move on to the second paper I have chosen here. Again, I'm going to execute the same, roughly the same process. It's a 14-page paper. Starts with something for me, which is relatively familiar. Local Hamiltonians, Pauli operators, some graphs. A lot more displayed equations than the previous paper. A little bit more challenging. I mean, I see some familiar things here, like the eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition. As we go through, you now encounter perturbation theory. Now, okay, that's fairly familiar to me, but I don't use perturbation theory as a, as a daily, in my daily work. So that's, it would require some perhaps uh, remedial work just to remember the plus and minus sign. Now we come to something that looks to be the, perhaps the main construction of the paper. It's still looking reasonably familiar to me. There's operations that I understand here. There's notations I'm familiar with, Pauli operators, local Hamiltonians. This is stuff that I work with. But then there's, now this is where it gets somewhat more challenging. Mm. P's and sums and products, okay. This might be a bit more demanding. And okay, let's charge on. But now we come to numerical examples. That's a good hint that maybe the sort of the main part of the paper is over by page eight, seven, seven, eight. Okay, so as an undertaking, perhaps that's not going to be so demanding. We'll just have to get familiar with perturbative expansions for eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which appears to be nicely summarized in the appendix. Okay, and now comes some somewhat intimidating young diagrams or something. Okay, mm, I'd rather not spend 12 weeks learning the representation theory of the symmetry group. It's maybe necessary to understand this, maybe not, not sure. And then we got some convergence estimates and now we're at the references on page 14. Okay, it's got a fairly large moment of inertia perhaps even a bit more than the previous paper, less text, but more equations. Maybe that's easier, maybe that's harder, I don't know. So let's move now to the third paper that I've got in front of me, Lagrangian representation for fermionic linear optics by Sergei Bravi. Now, I actually have looked through this paper before, so I have some sense of how difficult this one will be. Um, okay, there's some introduction, now we get it's two column format, so that means there's a higher density really of text and equations too. So even though the paper itself is some 12 pages long, realistically in single column it'd be more like 15 pages. Okay, we commence with fermionic linear optics. We see some creation operators, some quadratic Hamiltonians in terms of creation operators. This is stuff that I lecture regularly in quantum field theory or many body theory. So this doesn't look too intimidating yet. And then we come to anti-commuting variables, Grassmann numbers. Those I also fairly regularly uh, lecture in my uh, lectures on many body theory and quantum field theory. So this is not yet looking 
at all unfamiliar. Indeed, I can certainly, if we decide to go on this paper, I can certainly give you references to this material. Uh, differentiation, okay, this looks fairly safe stuff. And now comes Gaussian states. Now I have actually used this material somewhat in a lecture once, but I have no, no recollection of the details. So at about page, what is this? Page four, the material becomes unfamiliar. I distantly remember giving these definitions in a lecture maybe five years ago. And by page five, this is where it looks like it's getting really interesting. Um, he introduces the notion of a Gaussian operator. This is something I'd really like to know. Uh, he goes through the details, apparently, of doing this. Now we get into some really interesting notation with tensor products and Grassmann numbers. This is where it gets slightly intimidating. Second order derivatives, uh, exponentials, Gaussian linear maps. This is very uh, unfamiliar now for me. And we come now presumably to the main results of the paper, completely positive Gaussian maps, and pretty intricate details here. Lots of equations, not super lots of text. Uh, and finally, we reach the end of the paper at page 12. So as I said, because there's two column format, realistically in single column format, that would be a lot more, maybe 15, 16 pages in reality. Okay, again, this is a bit of a heavier paper, a, de a bit more details than the first paper. So that's the, th the three papers I have uh, short, uh, shortlisted, and that's my sort of initial assessment of these papers, just absolutely superficially scanning through the papers. Now, I still haven't made a decision yet. You know, each paper has pros and cons. The black holes as mirrors, there's fewer equations, but more text. Maybe the text is really deep and full of deep physics. Presumably it is. I mean, John Preskill and Patrick Hayden are certainly uh, experts in this area. I presume it will be absolutely fill packed filled of intuition and information. Uh, the perturbative gadget is perhaps more focused on a topic, but then the details really matter. I can't sort of brush over one, one derivation. And the Lagrangian representation is also heavy on details. So I'm not yet decided on what I want to do here. So the next thing I might do is, uh, is look sort of how, how much impact of these papers had on the scientific community. And the way I'll do that is I'll just see how many times have these papers been cited and by who. And the easiest way to do that is from the archive screen, it's just to click on the Google Scholar thing and then tap on the cited by, uh, cited by link. And now we get a, a list of the papers who cited this first paper, Black Holes as Mirrors. And there's some 600 papers citing this paper. And interestingly, the papers that cite this paper are also highly cited. Now citations are certainly a terrible metric for evaluating good science, but it's also an interesting metric um, to give you a sense of how much impact a paper has had. Impact might not be good or might not be good though. It's important to stress that. Okay, what do we see here? Well, we see a bunch of papers have cited the black hole paper, uh, black holes as mirrors paper, and each of these papers on the first page has themselves been cited many times. Now, uh, I'm not gonna draw a conclusion from that the number of citations is not the important factor here. What I want to draw, the conclusion I want to draw is based on the papers themselves that are citing this paper. And so I see very familiar papers to me. So black holes, complementarity or firewalls. Um, this is the paper on the so-called AMPS paradox, very influential in recent times. The next paper is called A Bound on Chaos by Maldacena, Schenker and Stanford, also a very influential paper in recent times. Cool Horizons for Entangled Black Holes, another influential paper, um, one that I've also um, read through. Black Holes and the Butterfly Effect, I've also taken a look at this paper, a very important paper. Fast Scramblers, another fascinating paper. So the, the, imp the impression, and one of my personal favorites, Holographic Quantum Error Correcting Codes, Toy Models for the Bog Boundary Correspondence. That's a paper that's heavily influenced me in the past years. So what I'm seeing is this paper is itself cited by papers that I find super interesting. The next one we'll take a look at is perturbative gadgets at arbitrary orders. Let's click on the Google Scholar link. Okay, it didn't work out, so you can see what goes on. 
try and get rid of the thing that's messing it up. So, okay, there's the paper. It's cited by 99. Papers, oh, no slouch, this paper. What papers have cited it? Also some total classics. Adiabatic quantum computation, the Schrieffer wolf transformation for quantum many body systems. Really that's been a, uh, a decisive tool in recent years to study the dynamics and statics of quantum many body systems. Quantum memories based on engineered dissipation, also a classic idea. Um, adiabatic machine learning, makes contact with other things that I find really interesting. Quantum simulation of many body, Hamiltonians using perturbation theory of bounded strength interactions, also an interesting thing. Okay, I'm seeing that lots of papers, but these papers are cited perhaps mm, factor five less than the original, the, the black holes as mirrors paper. What conclusion do I draw from that? None at all. I don't think this is relevant for um, what makes a paper interesting or not interesting. It may just have to do with the citation culture in these two different areas. But what I do find important is the names or the, 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 the top 10 papers that are citing it. You know, are these papers for me personally interesting papers? And this paper here I find personally very interesting. Uh, here they show how to map a n qubit target Hamiltonian with bounded strength k body interactions onto a simulator Hamiltonian. Very relevant for today's in today's times when we're on the edge of building scalable quantum computers. All right, third and final paper is the Lagrangian representation paper. Uh, how many times has it been cited? 119, it's really pretty, pretty non-trivial. Gaussian quantum information, right? I mean, any any self-respecting quantum information theorist should at least have some passing familiar, familiarity with Gaussian methods. Violation of the interpret area law for fermions. Great paper. Device independent quantum key distribution. Who thought that had anything to do with fermions? Entanglement spectrum of topological insulators and superconductors. Universal quantum computation with the, the new equals five half fractional quantum Hall state. Lots of papers that have had, uh, and what's interesting about this third paper is the kind of sheer variety of papers that have cited it. You know, one's on Gaussian quantum information. Okay, that's fairly natural. But then comes something about area laws and then fully device independent quantum key distribution. I and mean, what's going on with that? Why is this paper finding interesting to cite the, um, a paper on fermions? And also some really influential results using quantum computation and anions. Um, a paper by one of my co-authors on fermionic projected entangled pair states. Lots of papers that I've, I've, I've uh, Looked at several times, some of them I've read in detail. Lots of very, very interesting results. So in a way, this hasn't helped me at all. All I've learned is that there, these are three papers that have been influential in ways that are important to me. Uh, and I feel uh, unfortunately no closer to making a final decision of what paper to read because they're all interesting. Okay, so then sometimes when all options seem equally as good as each other, you should just make a random choice. And so perhaps I'll just Google a random number between zero and three and then make my decision that way. So let's have a look. Uh, I hope Google can offer, I'm gonna try and generate a random number between zero and one. Let's see what happens. No, Google cannot do it. Uh, and I've got three things, so I can't flip a coin. And I don't have a three-sided dice handy. And I don't have MATLAB running. Uh, so in the absence of any way of quickly and easily generating a random number on camera, I'll just take the first paper. So the idea is now that out of pure and total randomness, I'll just choose the number one. And the number one means that we'll take a look at in this seminar, the paper Black Holes as Mirrors, Quantum Information and Random Subsystems by Patrick Hayden and John Preskill. Okay, and of course, I'd love to look at the other two papers. Unfortunately, I don't think there will be enough time in this course, but of course, if we get through this paper somehow very quickly, then why not? We can move on to the other two, both interesting papers. So that's my first 
that's you know, just giving you an insight into my decision making process in coming to this paper, black holes as mirrors, quantum information in random systems, uh, as the focus of this seminar. And as you'll see, as you've seen, it's got more to do with what I think is interesting, what papers cited and how interesting I find them, and also pure and utter arbitrary randomness. So let's make a start on this paper. Take a look again at my seminar notes. See what I have prepared here in terms of notes for what to do. Okay, yeah, I wanted to give you an insight into the choice of paper, why this particular paper. The next thing I wanted to talk about was the processes I use to read a paper. So you've seen one process I use, and that's looking at the forward citations, who cites the paper, and what, what can, inferences can I draw from the papers that cite the paper that we're interested in. The next thing will be to just give a quick overview of the paper to develop a quick overview. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to read the abstract. Here's the abstract. I'm just going to read this aloud, and then I will uh, talk about my impressions upon reading the abstract. So, the abstract reads. We study information retrieval from evaporating black holes, assuming that the internal dynamics of a black hole is unitary and rapidly mixing, and assuming that the retriever has unlimited control over the emitted Hawking radiation. If the evaporation of the black hole has already proceeded past the halfway point, where half of the initial entropy has been radiated away, then additional quantum information deposited in the black hole is revealed in the Hawking radiation very rapidly. Information deposited prior to the halfway point remains concealed until the halfway point and then emerges quickly. These conclusions hold because typical local quantum circuits are efficient encoders for quantum error correcting codes that nearly achieve the capacity of the quantum erasure channel. Our estimate of a black hole's information retention time based on speculative dynamical assumptions is just barely compatible with the black hole complementarity hypothesis. That was the abstract. Now, there's a lot that needs clarifying when reading an abstract like this. I'm already sort of developing a laundry list of questions that we're gonna try and address in this seminar. So what's this paper about? Well, black holes and information retrieval. And these black holes are evaporating. And there's some assumption here, the internal dynamics of the black hole is unitary, okay? So you may have heard of this black hole information paradox. I've heard of it too. I don't understand the black hole, informa black hole information paradox, but I've heard of it. And I know there's lots of, there's some tension between uh, the various assumptions we make about the dynamics of black holes. And one of the tensions is with so-called unitarity. I hope that we'll understand that better after we read this paper. So the assumptions are that the internal dynamics of the black hole is unitary. So it's a big assumption, I understand. And rapidly mixing, that's apparently another very important assumption. And then we also assume that the retriever has unlimited control over the emitted Hawking radiation. So I guess the picture we're meant to have in mind as I read that sentence uh, is that of some kind of uh, observer, perhaps not a particularly physical observer. So here's, here's the, my cartoon of a black hole and it's uh, you know, I, th I, I assume you've heard that black holes are meant to radiate and the radiation is coming off this black hole and presumably this observer has built some kind of Dyson sphere around the black hole. So this is the ultimate observer. They've built some kind of crazy Dyson sphere around this black hole. And all around this black hole, they've got amazing detectors. These detectors are so incredible that they can coherently measure all the quantum information coming off of this radiation. So that's the picture I have in mind when I'm reading this abstract. So uh, the retriever has unlimited control. They can do anything within the world. I'm gonna go ahead and imagine that we're meant to think that this control is allowed by the laws of physics. I mean, you can do unlimited things that violate the laws of physics, but I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that the author's meant within the laws of physics. If the evaporation of the black hole has already proceeded past the halfway point, so a bit mysterious commentary, a bit mysterious definition there, halfway point, don't know what that means. Hopefully we'll find out. 
They sort of define it in the abstract here where half of the initial entropy has been radiated away. Okay, now I've got a real question, right? Because we've said in the abstract that the dynamics of the black hole is unitary, but then there's this talk of initial entropy changing. So how can a unitary process change entropy? Hmm, don't know, hope we find out. Then additional quantum information deposited in the black hole is revealed in the Hawking radiation very rapidly. Okay, if we go back to my Dyson sphere, pic, you know, sort of cartoon of what this paper must be about, presumably it's sort of hard to really make sense of, of what's written in the abstract at this point because we've got something happening unitarily, but then entropy flowing out of the system. Hopefully the authors will clarify this point. These con and information deposited prior to the halfway point remains concealed until the halfway point and then emerges quickly. So that seems important. The authors seem to, to want to stress this point. Concealed until the halfway point. These conclusions hold because typical local circuits are efficient encoders for quantum error correcting codes that nearly achieve the capacity of the quantum erasure channel. Wow. Okay, I didn't see local quantum circuits coming in the discussion about black holes. It's not these sort of two phenomena don't really have at first sight much to do with each other, right? You have a black hole, which is presumably some galactic you know, heavenly body, and you have quantum circuits, which I usually would associate with ultra cold um, systems, usually pretty tiny systems. So this is kind of amazing to think that these two things could be related or have anything to do with each other. I find that pretty fascinating. Our estimate of the black hole's information retention time based on speculative, okay, now, now that's sort of important to stress, I guess, speculative dynamical assumptions is just barely compatible with the black hole complementarity hypothesis, whatever that is. So that's sort of the things that pop out at me when looking at the abstract here. We've got unitarity information, radiation, speculative, complementarity. Hopefully these things will become clear as we read through the paper. So that's my first brush with this paper, so to speak. I read through the abstract, I try and see what pops out, see what I know about these things and what I find currently mysterious. The next part of this paper, uh, of my process of reading through this paper, will be to start looking at the introduction. I find introductions to be an extraordinarily helpful part of reading a paper. You can get a real sense of uh, where the paper finds itself in the context of the larger scientific literature. And also often these papers, uh, and the introduction will cite all the important papers that you should know about anyway. So let's take a look at the introduction. And I'm a big believer and find it quite helpful to read things aloud. So I will read probably by the end of this seminar every word of this paper aloud. Let's take a look at the introduction. So is the information consumed by a black hole destroyed and lost forever? Citation one. What's this paper? Let's find out. Citation one. I don't have a quick way to getting to that, so I have to... I'm not completely familiar with how this program works. Actually, I have an idea how to speed this process up in a minute. Okay, so here's the paper they refer to, Stephen Hawking's Breakdown of Predictability in Gravitational Co Collapse. So it's a good practice as you read through the paper to get access to all the papers that are cited by the paper in question. Now, that is my goal now to obtain all those papers. So what we'll do is we'll get rid of all these tabs here that I have open that aren't no longer to do with the paper we're gonna to read today. And instead, we'll go to this one. This is the paper itself, published in Journal of High Energy Physics in 2007. Now, how am I gonna get a hold of these citations pretty quickly? Well, hopefully in the PDF here, I can just tap on the links, okay? That didn't work. All right, then I'll have to Google them. So let's paste that in. Here's the Hawking paper. And we'll load that up. 
So the first paper, and presumably this is the paper that launched the, the, the Hayden Prescott paper, is a paper of Stephen Hawking, Breakdown of Predictability and Gravitational Collapse. Of course, this is an absolute classic, um, hugely influential in quantum gravity. And I have the paper here. Will I be able to get the PDF without logging into the VPN? Unfortunately not. So what I'll do is I'll leave that paper here in the current form just as an abstract. And then what we'll do is just collect the citations as we read through the introduction and leave them as open tabs. It's not perhaps necessary at this stage to read through all the papers that are cited by this paper, but to at least have access to them because access to them because you never know as you read through the paper, they might refer to various paragraphs in the citations. So yes, that means we'll have a lot of tabs open, but uh, on the other hand, it means we'll have quick access to the material. In the old days, I would walk down to the library and go into the stacks, the journal stacks, and pull out the journals themselves and walk to the photocopier and laboriously photocopy each page of every paper cited by the paper I was reading. Um, actually, that had some pretty key advantages. One is that you really have seen every page of every paper that's cited by the one you're reading and because you have to photocopy them. And although it would take you half a day to do this, or maybe a whole day or a couple of days, at the end of it, you have a pretty good syntopic view of the literature around the paper you're interested in. So, you know, these days that's not super easy anymore because, you know, uh, who wants to pick up physically journals and who can in these days? Uh, and it's made me a bit lazy, I have to admit. I don't uh, look through the papers that are cited by a paper anymore. Should do, but I don't. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the paper in question here. So this is the black holes paper and then go back to the beginning of it. I don't know the keyboard shortcuts for this program yet. Okay, is the information consumed by a black hole and destroyed and lost forever? I don't know, maybe. Or might it be recovered from the Hawking radiation that is emitted as the black hole evaporates? Evidence from string theory suggests that the information, rather than being destroyed, can be encoded in the black hole's internal degrees of freedom and eventually transferred to the outgoing radiation. However, the issue remains controversial and in any event, the mechanism by which information escapes from a black hole remains elusive. Let's take a look at the two papers cited here. That's two and three. Try and download those. At least have the tabs open. Okay. Two and three, that's Strominger and Waffa. At least that's an archive reference here, so we had to copy it. There we go, microscopic orange origin, with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Sorry, I just realized I should open up the new tab. Let's try again. Maybe control click works here. Oh yeah, that worked. So there we go, this is the Strominger and Waffer paper. At least I'll download the PDFs. Okay, I won't photocopy the paper, but at least I'll have the PDF here, so we can just zoom through it. And this is something I really do uh, every time I want to read a paper in earnest, is look at the papers it cites. There's a lot you can gain there. You can get a real sort of, you know, you, you know, often the question you might have is like, why this paper? Why were you even looking at this paper? Why was this paper written? I don't understand why. Well, one way to understand why is look at the papers at sites. I mean, these are the papers the authors found interesting. They were reading these papers. They were thinking about these papers as they conceived of their own paper. And reading the introductions of all these papers starts to give you a sense of the, sort of the literature field, the area of the, of the topic, and why that was motivating. So I'm going to start doing precisely that. This is going to get a bit tedious. But I'll only do it for the first couple, and then we leave as a kind of homework the job of reading through the introductions of all the other papers. And what you'll find is that pretty quickly they become a bit repetitive. You'll start to notice commonalities in the introductions of the papers cited by the paper you're interested in. Okay, let's have a look. In the early 70s, a sharp and beautiful analogy was discovered between the laws of black hole dynamics and the laws of thermodynamics. In particular, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, one quarter the area of the event horizon behaves in every way like a thermodynamic entropy. A missing link in this circle of ideas is a precise statistical mechanical interpretation of black hole entropy. One would like to derive the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, including the numerical factor, by counting black hole microstates. 
The laws of black hole dynamics could then be identified with and not just be analogous to the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, so this paper tells me that it's important that, that black holes behave like thermodynamic systems and that we want to kind of understand their statistical mechanics. You know, what, what are the things making up uh, black holes? And we want to change analogies to actual quantitative connections. Okay, and I didn't read the abstract of the Hawking paper. I should do that now. The principle of equivalence, which says that gravity couples to the energy momentum tensor of matter and the quantum mechanical requirement that energy should be positive imply that gravity is always attractive. This leads to its singularities in any reasonable theory of gravitation. A singularity is a place where the classical concepts of space and time break down, and as do all the known laws of physics, because they are all formulated on a classical space-time background. In this paper, it is claimed that this breakdown is not merely a result of our ignorance of the correct theory, but that it represents a fundamental limitation to our ability to predict the future. That seems pretty bad for physics. A limitation that is analogous but additional to the limitation imposed by normal quantum mechanical uncertainty principle. The new limitation arises because general relativity allows the causal structure of space-time to be very different from that of Minkowski space. The interaction region can be bounded not only by an initial surface on which the data is given and the final surface on which measurements are made, but also a hidden surface about which the observer has only limited information, such as the mass, angular momentum, and charge. Concerning this hidden surface, one has a principle of ignorance. The surface emits with equal probability all configurations of particles compatible with the observer's limited knowledge. It is shown that the ignorance principle holds for the quantum mechanical evaporation of black holes. So I guess what Hawking means here is that if you don't know what microstate a uh, complex many-body system is in, then you better assume the equally mixed state. It is shown that the ignorance principle holds for the quantum mechanical evaporation of black holes. The black hole creates pair particles and pairs, with one particle always falling into the hole and the other possibly escaping to infinity. Because part of the information about the state of the system is lost down the hole, the final such situation is represented by a density matrix rather than a pure quantum state. This means that there is no S matrix for the process of black hole formation and evaporation. Instead, one has to introduce a new operator called the superscattering operator, which maps density operators describing the initial situation to density matrices describing the final situation. Let's draw a little cartoon of my of the sort of growing picture that I'm building as we are reading through these papers and their citations. Okay, here's a black hole, and then I meant to think, or at least the pictures I have in mind when I'm reading these abstracts now is that particles are created in pairs, pair creation, and one of them goes into the black hole and one radiates, or one propagates out like that and gets, uh, and the entanglement that this particle has, it's called particle, the infalling particle A and the outgoing particle B, uh, doesn't go away, right? And laws of physics at least should be somehow unitary, at least outside the black hole, who knows? And uh, presumably, it looks like a mixed state coming off. What mixed state? Well, from that first scan through Hawking's abstract, we're sort of meant to think a completely mixed state. We'll find out, I'm sure. Now, I also know, of course, that this picture is meant to be not quite right as well. I've heard that from my colleagues. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to build a clearer picture as we read through these papers. Okay, you can see what I've done. I've read through the, first, the abstracts of the first two uh, citations, sites here, the Hawking paper, the Kum and Buffer, and um, Strominger paper, and we haven't even made it to the third citation. Well, let's do that now. Oh yes, the large end limit of superconformal field theories and supergravity. Another extraordinary paper. It's Probably fair to say it's one of the most influential papers in all of high energy physics. This is the so-called this is the paper that launched the ADS CFT correspondence in earnest. I'll also read the abstract of this paper. We show that the large n limit of certain conformal field theories in various dimensions include in their Hilbert space a sector describing supergravity as the product of anti spacetimes, space times, spheres, and other compact manifolds. This is shown by taking some brains in the full M string theory and then taking a low energy limit where the field theory on the brain decouples from the ball. We observe that in this limit, we can still trust the near horizon geometry for large N. The enhanced supersymmetries of the near horizon geometry correspond to the extra supersymmetry generators present in the superconformal group, as opposed to just the superponcre group. The Etouffe limit of 
3 plus 1 n equals 4 superhang mills at the conformal point is shown to contain strings. They are 2b strings. We conjecture that compactifications of m-string theory on various anti de Sitter space forms is dual to various conformal field theories. This leads to a new proposal for a definition of m-theory which could be extended to include five non-compact dimensions. Okay, I must admit I don't even know some of the, uh, a fair degree of the terminology used in this abstract. And although I have indeed read through this paper before, uh, I'm not unfortunately an expert enough to produce much in the way of intelligent commentary here. However, what we learn, of course, is that one of the influences on the Black Holes as Mirrors paper is this ADS CFT paper. Let's get back to the paper itself. Uh, and now, so I've read two sentences of the introduction of this paper. Now let's get to the third sentence, I mean, quite a revealing sentence. However, the issue remains controversial. And in any event, the mechanism by which information escapes from a black hole remains elusive. Controversial, elusive. These are fantastic words to read in any physics paper because that's when physics is interesting. You know, you should really look for the controversial and not well formulated areas of physics if you want to find interesting research topics. Quantum information theory, ah, now that's something that I'm pretty happy with, addresses quantitative questions about the acquisition, transmission, and processing of information in quantum systems. Okay, citation four. Let's have a look, what's citation four? I bet it's, no, no, it's P Bennett and Shaw, quantum information theory. Okay, I can tell you right now, I won't be able to easily download that article. Uh, instead, what I'll do is I'll just take that under advisement that some review of quantum information theory was cited. It's not my purpose to go through quantum information theory in this seminar, so we'll just jump over that citation. Though quantum information theory cannot by itself resolve the black hole information puzzle, I wonder why, it can provide intuition tools that help to sharpen our understanding of the question. Um, in a way, this sentence here is kind of interesting given recent developments uh, falling under the rubric of the ER equals EPR proposal so recently, this hypothesis, I think, put forward by Lenny Susskind, uh, mainly championed by Lenny Susskind, is that somehow entanglement is dual to space-time geometry. There's also Van Ramsdonk, I believe, who has uh, championed this position. And so th there's, I, more recently, you know, the, this hypothesis is coming out that maybe entanglement has to do with space-time itself. And so this sentence in the int uh, in introduction of this paper from 2007, I believe, um, you know, is, is, is a little bit of tension with, with the current sort of hypotheses that are around. Namely, that quantum information alone cannot resolve the black hole information puzzle. Perhaps people might say it differently today. I don't know. In this paper, we assume that black holes, like other thermal systems, process quantum information rather than destroy it, and we apply insights from quantum information theory to study the information content of the Hawking radiation. Our conclusion is that, under plausible dynamical assumptions, the black hole releases information remarkably quickly, much faster than what might have been naively expected. Okay, that's apparently an interesting commentary. Then move on to now what's gonna go on in the paper apparently. Our analysis has two main components. At first, we assume that a black hole thermalizes quantum information arbitrarily quickly. Now, I do hope that we learn in the process of reading this paper uh, what the authors mean uh, by that because they said in the abstract that the black hole dynamics would be assumed unitary. And so how can a unitary process thermalize something? That's a sort of weird tension that I have right now as I read through the paper. So that we may model the internal dynamics of a black hole by an instantaneous random unitary transformation. So, you know, I have a suspicion, of course, of what the authors mean by thermalize. Uh, and the suspicion that I, you know, the building in my mind is that although the black hole dynamics is a supposed unitary and therefore cannot increase or decrease the entropy of the black hole. Locally, if you look at restricted set of observables, you will see that some observables will move from having definite predictions or definite um, expectation values to being uh, non-deterministic or randomized. Or So if you only look at subsystems of the black hole, then it will look like it's heating up, even though the whole state of the black hole is in fact pure, perhaps pure, or at least evolving unitarily. 
Under this assumption, we show in section 3 that if a black hole's internal degrees of freedom are nearly maximally entangled with a previously emitted Hawking radiation, as one would expect, also in, uh, uh, this seems to correlate with what Hawking says in his, his, his abstract, as would be expected for a black hole that has already radiated more than half of its initial entropy, then k qubits of quantum information dumped into the black hole will be revealed after just a few more than k qubits are emitted into the Hawking radiation. This observation rests on, a known, on known achievable rates for entanglement-assisted quantum communication through a quantum erasure channel. Five. Let's take a look at citation five. This is Bennett, Shaw, Smolin, and Tapiel, a super classic in quantum information theory. Let's take a pause to read the abstract of this paper. Prior entanglement between sender and receiver, which exactly doubles the classical capacity of a noiseless quantum channel, can increase the classical capacity of some noisy quantum channels by an arbitrarily large constant factor depending on the channel relative to the best known classical capacity achievable without entanglement. The enhancement factor is greatest for very noisy channels with positive classical capacity but zero quantum capacity. We obtain exact expressions for the entanglement assisted capacity of depolarizing and erasure channels in D dimensions. Okay, I'll take that under advisement. Then, the authors go on, we re-examine the issue of a black hole's thermalization time and we argue in section 4 and 5 that a black hole's internal quantum state becomes thoroughly mixed in a Schwarzschild time of order rs log rs divided by lp, where rs is the black hole's Schwarzschild radius and lp is the Planck length, where the speed of light is c equals 1. This argument, based on speculative dynamical assumptions, will be very interesting to learn what they are, relies on a recent construction of efficient quantum circuits that realize approximate unitary two designs, six and seven. Let's download those citations. Okay, we have two papers here, efficient and approximate unitary two designs, and efficient simulation of random states and operators. Take a look at the abstracts of these papers. Here we go. Exact and approximate unitary two designs and their application to fidelity estimation. We developed the concept of a unitary T design as a means of expressing operationally useful subsets of the stochastic properties of the uniform Ha measure on the unitary group on n qubits. Ah, well, if you've seen my previous video, you'll see that I quite like the Ha measure. In particular, sets of unitaries forming two designs have wide applicability to quantum information protocols. We devise an ON size in place circuit construction for an approximate two unitary two design. We then show that this can be used to construct an efficient protocol for experimentally characterizing the fidelity of a quantum process on n qubits with quantum circuits of size ON without requiring any ancillary qubits, thereby improving upon previous approaches. Okay, so they use, they approximate the harm measure with somehow a discrete set of unitary gates. And here we have a thesis. I'm not going to read the abstract of the thesis out. I presume they cite this thesis because it has the details of the previously cited paper uh, contained in it. Okay, combining with the previous seeding result, we infer that for a black hole whose evaporation is past the halfway point, k qubits absorbed by the black hole will be re-emitted in a Schwarzschild time OKRS or ORS log RS divided by LP, whichever is larger. If we accept that black holes evolve unitarily and encode quantum information in their Hawking radiation, then we are faced with the challenge of reconciling this phenomenon with the perspective of an infalling absorber who tumbles through the event horizon. We do not attempt to resolve this mystery here. Ah, bummer. Oh well. Rather, we focus on the behavior of the black hole from the perspective of observers who stay outside. Fair enough. I guess if you're inside the black hole, you won't be reporting to us on your experiences. To these observers, a black hole is a seething cauldron of microscopic degrees of freedom localized close to the horizon, about one qubit per Planck unit of area undergoing local unitary dynamics with a characteristic time scale of order the Planck time. Citations eight or nine. Let's find out what they are. Uh, here we go. This is the black hole complementary paper, complementarity paper. And this one is a paper by Susskind and Lindsay, unfortunately, not easy to access. Well, hopefully the first of those two citations will contain information, enough information for us to get a sense of what was being cited here. So the abstract of the paper, The Stretched Horizon and Black Hole Complementarity, reads, 
three postulates asserting the validity of conventional quantum theory, semi-classical general relativity, and the statistical basis for the thermodynamics are introduced as a foundation for the study of black hole evolution. We explain these postulate, how these postulates may be implemented in a stretched horizon or membrane description of the black hole appropriate to a distant observer. The technical analysis is illustrated in the simplified context of a 1 plus 1 dimensional dilaton gravity. Our postulates imply that the dissipative properties of the stretched horizon arise from a coarse graining of microphysical degrees of freedom that the horizon must possess. A principle of black hole complementarity is advocated. The overall viewpoint is similar to that pioneered by Etoft, but the detailed implementation is different. Okay, uh, the interesting word that popped out to me there was coarse graining. That sort of matches with the, oops, the content of the, the title of the seminar, coarse graining and renormalization, very closely related. We assume, now we return to the original paper, we assume that the observers refrain from attempting to probe the microscopic degrees of freedom directly, which would be far too dangerous. That's a fantastic. Rather, they are content to infer how the black hole processes information indirectly by observe, investigating the relationship between the infalling matter and the outgoing radiation. So if we return to my cartoon, so here's the Dyson sphere. I guess we set up experiments where some, radi some in matter is prepared in some kind of special state, perhaps an entangled state of two particles. One particle is allowed to fly in after this so-called halfway point, and the other particle is retained for analysis. I guess that's the picture I'm meant to have in mind as we read through this paper. We will, however, address in section six whether our claim that information escapes rapidly from black holes can be reconciled with the hypothesis of black hole complementarity, according to which no violations of the accepted principles of quantum physics can be de detected by any observer, whether outside or inside the black hole. Uh, this is interesting. I've never really had a definition for black hole complementarity. It must have been said to me many times, but I don't remember the details. So according to which no violations of the accepted principles of quantum physics can be detected by any observer, whether outside or inside the black hole. I certainly enjoy this definition. I'd like myself an operational definition. So um, no violations. Quantum physics detected, I like the word detected, um, by any observer. That sort of, you know, suggests that violations can happen, but they can never be detected. Sounds pretty cool. We conclude that rapid escape and black hole complementarity are compatible, but only just barely, or just barely so. Okay, so this has been going on nearly an hour, the reading of the introduction, and I've highlighted some things that I find interesting in this paper, in the introduction, and we've downloaded essentially all the papers that this paper cites. And at this stage, I've read uh, the abstracts of most of the papers that have been cited in the paper we're reading. And it's good to keep these papers handy. I'm just flipping through these tabs now, because as time passes, we should, as a piece of good practice, read each of these papers. And in this case, it's pretty manageable. We have, what, you know, some eight tabs open here. So that's seven tabs. So there's not so many papers to read. Now, in the context of a seminar like this, uh, the amount of material grows exponentially uh, in this fashion. If you start looking at the introductions of every paper that you look at in the introduction and so on. And so what I will do is set this rather as a homework to read through these seven papers. Now, how, what do I mean by read? I mean, there's various ways to understand the word read when you come to a scientific paper. In this case, I would say any paper cited in the introduction of the paper you want to read, you should read. And not like read every word and check every equation. No, just read the abstracts as I've done, and then also read the introductions and the conclusions and skim through the content of the paper. So I'll give you an example. So let's take a look at this, uh, well, why not the, the black hole complementarity paper? What I, would, what I would define as reading in this context here is read the abstract, which we've done together. Now read through the introduction, which you'll do at, leisure, at your leisure. And then that may take you, what, 10 minutes or something. And you read through the introduction and then uh, 
you hope that the introduction isn't the whole paper and that there's some sections. Okay, it doesn't look like there are in fact any sections in this paper. So we'll have define the introduction to having stopped at the end of postulate three. And then you'll sort of zoom through the paper and see, does anything pop out? Is there any interesting equations or are there any, um, any uh, diagrams in the paper that give you some insight into the content? Now this, I, I absolutely love this. If provided with an electrical multimeter, our observer will discover that the membrane has a surface resistivity of 377 ohms. So what on earth is a resistivity doing in the context of a black hole paper with such a specific number? It's fantastic. I'd love to look up, love to learn more about that. Okay, now we zoom through the paper, we get into some nitty gritties of quantum gravity in one plus one dimensions. Okay, I don't expect in looking through this paper to check all of this. Just want to get a sense of what's in there. Okay, we look through that. Oh, some nice Hawking uh, Penrose diagrams. Some more Penrose diagrams. Okay, some actions. So this is this is more or less the speed at which I would look through the, uh, a paper cited in an introduction. Uh, okay, lots of classical stuff. Then there's this thing called the stretched horizon. I can see that that's important. It's in the title. Um, but I don't know if I'll understand the definition. All right, we'll take a look through this. You can see that the way in which I'm looking through the paper is very similar to the way in which I evaluated the papers to choose of, of the shortlist for this for today's seminar. Just zooming through, seeing is there anything popping out. Okay, lots of lots of content in this paper. Lots of classical general relativity content in this paper. Okay, so I sort of you know put a note down uh, mentally. So good practice, of course, at this point would be to take your observations and write them down in the form of notes somewhere. I haven't been doing that. I've been pretty lazy, mm, and. Instead, my notes will be just in the form of, of this video. But good practice when you look through a paper is to, this, these observations I've been making is to really write them down. So for example, as you observe that the words brainy motion have some, uh, make an appearance in the paper, you, you say in your notes on the paper, Brownian motion was mentioned. Now this is also particularly fascinating. Why is Brownian motion making an appearance? I uh, don't know. Okay. It looks like this is a weighty paper with a lot going on in it and probably take quite a few hours to read it properly. That's not the purpose of today though, all of this seminar. So we're going to zoom now to the end and just take a look at the conclusions. What did they conclude from all of this? Lots of text. Lots of text. Is there a conclusions? Here, discussion. Um, okay, this I would also read probably aloud and every word in order to get a sense of what this paper was about. I won't do that now, that's your homework. So that's the main homework from today. Take these eight, seven, eight papers that have been cited in the introduction, read their abstracts, read their introductions, read their conclusions and take a glance at the contents. What do you achieve by doing this? you get a sense of the literature, of the research area. And to do it, really best practice would be then to look at the papers that these papers in turn cite and so on and so on and so on until you, you know, explore the entire literature field. It sounds ridiculous, but actually you'll be amazed at how there's so many commonalities between these papers that you can start to give a kind of bullet point summary of the area of the field itself. Hopefully next week, um, I'll be able to give you a list of bullet points, or maybe you'll be able to contribute some bullet points that you, you can observe from reading through the literature. And that brings us more or less to the conclusion of today's video. The objective today was to select a paper to read in this reading seminar, to uh, read through the abstract and the introduction to get a sense of what the paper's about and what the literature looks like in this area and that's what we've managed to achieve and there's a homework the homework is to read each of the papers cited in the introduction to some degree and to make some notes on their content looking in particular stress looking for commonalities between these papers what are the points what are the authors of all these papers fascinated by what is it that motivates them to write the, these papers you know there's some hundreds of pages now cited what is it that 
brought these hundreds of pages into existence is are they all completely independent or are they are, are they you know are there common threads are there common ideas that's the objective in the next week to get that sense of these things then next week we'll read section two a classical randomizer um, it's always good to have a kind of look ahead um, classical sounds good feels like we should be able to understand that fairly quickly um, okay we see a lot of text so maybe it'll be more reading and less math some probabilities, and then presumably in week three, we'll take a look at a quantum randomizer. So this looks pretty achievable, actually, next week. In fact, more than achievable. I would say I would read it aloud, and there doesn't even appear to be a paper cited. No, there is one citation here, so I'll definitely check that out next week. And I don't see much else in the way of material there. So it's possible that next week we'll get through section two quite quickly and already on to, to section three with the uh, circled maximally entangled state. Okay, but that's it for today. I thank you very much for watching uh, and certainly encourage you to take a look at the, the papers that we've looked at today. Also, please do contribute uh, in the form of questions or discussion if you feel that you, there's something that I missed in this video, or if you feel that there's some, something that interesting that should be highlighted about this paper in question. I hope you enjoyed this. Stay healthy. Thank you and goodbye.